received offers. Now, this was a month ago, but at the time, uh, about, thir about a, a third, a little over a third of agents were getting offers on their um, listed, uh, actively listed properties. And, um, you know, that's happened with our team too. Uh, we have, we've had offers on um, a listing that we have in Greenpoint. I actually got an accepted offer for a buyer uh, this past week. So it is happening. Um, so now between April 15th and May 13th, so in the past month, if you submitted or received an offer, was it accepted or rejected? In Brooklyn and Queens, out of 125 responses, we are now at 44% of offers being accepted, 56% being rejected. This number actually, the accepted number is creeping up. Uh, before we got the May data, we were at about a third were accepted. So it's gone from uh, three out of three out of eleven to four out of eleven being being accepted. So for accepted offers, what did those look like? What was the percent discount? You can see that a pretty large proportion of the of the accepted offers, and this is out of five, 55 responses, are somewhere between I mean, actually, one out of six were at the asking price, 17%. Um, and then, and uh, less than, really less than, um, less than a six, about a six of them also were accepted at like a low ball offer, more than 10% off the asking price. Um, the rest in between, and it, it, it's a large proportion, but the good news for sellers who are afraid that with the market right now, that they have to accept some sort of a lowball offer. That's not necessarily the case. You see, the large, the large majority of offers that were accepted. Paul, your audio isn't working. Oh, can you hear me? I hear him. Um, can anyone else? Can you give me one second? Uh, a little better, but there's like a bit of a. Okay. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Okay. okay. Can you hear me? It's okay. Great. All right. Yeah. So what I was saying is that, you know, uh, for sellers uh, who are worried about having to accept an offer 10% under ask, you know, the, the, the vast majority of, of accepted offers are, are not that low. Rejected offers. You'll see the rejected offers are primarily lowball offers, right? Um, about two thirds of what was rejected was uh, more than 10% under the ask. So though there are lowball offers coming out there. Now, one thing I noticed is that with the new numbers, the proportion overall of lowball offers is decreasing. Um, before the May numbers came out, we were looking like 60% of offers were lowball offers. Now we're at 44% of offers are lowball offers. And 30% of offers were within 4% of the asking price. So that's good news for sellers, uh, not good news for people who, you know, are hoping to make low ball offers and get them accepted. Uh, and then there's one last interesting piece of data that we have, which is, okay, if you have a list, if you were planning to list or you had your place on the market and took it off, what are you, what is your seller inclined to do? So, Almost 50% of people said that they were going to list ASAP once the market resumed. Um, about one out of six are either going to wait till the fall or wait till next year. And then we have this a little more than one third who are undecided. And that is going to be a big key for um, whether supply keeps up with the demand uh, when the market resumes or not. So that's my data to share. Uh, Scott, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do actually. Um, I, I think, you know, I think it's it's an interesting time because um, my feeling is that uh, the market will be there'll be pent up demand when we get back up. And on the other hand, I think there's a big misconception by many people thinking of selling. I've even had a conversation with some real estate attorneys who think that the market is not going to be very good. And I think they're wrong. So I think the, the prices, 
you know, for sellers, this might be very good news because if people are of the, of the thought that they should wait to list their house or apartment and there is demand, um, it's going to make the market very strong for sellers. Um, and I think, again, I think it's a misconception. I think personally, you'd be better off listing your house or apartment as we're coming out of this than in the fall, because in the fall, we're going to be dealing with the election. There's going to be a lot of uncertainty. And I think people will be more hesitant to sort of uh, make a commitment. So um, I also I also think that you're going to we're going to have some economic issues in, in the fall, too. I mean, uh, that's when most people I know uh, expect there to be more like the white collar layoffs in, in the fall. Right. Um, so that, that'll hurt the market as well. So we're, we're talking about my feeling is if, if you're if you're not sure what to do and you do want to sell the property you own, you're better off putting it up. I mean, I think, look, not many people are going to be going on uh, vacations in July. Maybe they'll take, you know, a week at an Airbnb, but they're not flying to Paris. So I think you're going to have a lot of people around and looking at properties in July. Not that July historically has been okay, but, you know, clearly toward the end of by August, we see very, you know, limited activity. But now I think, I think even August could be okay. I think my perception is you'd be better off putting up a property in July than in September. That would be my guess. But, you know, again, I, I, you know, it's, it'll be interesting to see what people think and do um, as we come out of this. And as we've learned from this experience, you know, it's hard to, to, be to have definitive knowledge about anything because if someone told me I'd be sitting in my apartment for, you know, two and a half months, I would have told you you were crazy. So, um, yeah. I mean, yeah. August, will be, August will probably be pretty busy. I mean, think of why we are slow in August is because people go on vacation, right? They go on vacation to Europe or, they, you know, they, they travel and that's, that's not happening this year, right? Well, I, mean, I, I, think, I think you'll see some of it. It'll just be much some. more limited, very limited. I mean, it'll, it's going to, yeah, definitely. I mean, we were, we usually go away in August and this year, I don't think we are. I mean, I think we're going to stick around. Yeah. No, I, I think most people will be the same. If anything, I think they'll they're mostly travel by car and they're not going that far. That would be right. my thought about right. what's exactly. going If on. we go away, we're going to go to like the Adirondacks or the Catskills. Right, right. right. Um, so, um, I, so if people, do people have any questions? Because we'd be happy to answer them and you can put them in the chat. Um, Actually, Scott, you know, one thing I wanted to mention here that I was thinking about sure. is because we did get some additional data on new listings versus in contracts. Okay. So the number of new listings is increasing, right? Okay. But the number of contracts is not. And that's something to be aware of if you are a seller um, is that supply is increasing. The number of contracts is not keeping up with that yet. Of course, we're not really showing yet. So that's not a big surprise, right? I mean, if you put a place on the market right now, it's, you'd be shocked if it actually sold immediately. But, um, but it, it is something to keep an eye on. And I think that if you are a seller, then you can't just take for granted, even if it is a good, like a relatively good seller's market, like supply, outpace, uh, supply is less than demand. I think that you can't take for granted that your place will sell quickly. And I think it's important to, you know, to really make your place seem as desirable as possible. Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, that's always the case. You know, the other thing I want to mention, which we discussed on Wednesday, is one of the great things about um, Compass's, Compass has really good tools for people to see properties virtually. Um, and I think, um, you know, my suspicion is in many situations, um, you know, depend, again, depending on the property, but there might be situations where, um, you know, being able to see it virtually first will be very helpful because I don't, again, given all that's going on, I don't see people wanting to traipse around, um, 
you know, I think we're still going to need to limit contact with people as much yeah. as possible. Yeah. And I think having good virtual tools will make a difference. And um, I actually you know, got two, um, I got two um, applications for one of my rentals yesterday just based off of the YouTube tour that I made. Yeah, I, look, it's clearly happening. Apartments are being rented without, you know, if people know the neighborhood and they see what the apartment looks like, um, you know, yeah. apartments are definitely being rented yeah. off virtual tours. There's no question about it. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what I would think about that myself, but clearly it's happening. So that's a good thing for landlords and for tenants. So, um, and, nope. and uh, to be clear, uh, moving companies are considered an essential uh, service. So uh, it's very easy to, uh, to get movers these days, as, you know, as, as usual, just with a little heads up. Yeah. Bill and Drew have a couple of questions. One of them is, what does TOTM mean? So TOTM means temporarily off the market. That means somebody had a listing up um, and then when the pandemic hit and the shutdown happened, they decided to temporarily take it off as opposed to um, permanently off the market, which means we're just not selling right now. Uh, your other question, uh, can you explain white collar layoffs? What I mean by that is, you know, not to be glib, uh, it, uh, what I meant was, you know, my friends who are in finance, my friends who are in like um, big law, corporate, uh, corp like corporate law, um, which was my background. I, I worked in um, corporate litigation uh, before being a real estate agent. Uh, that I think, um, and also I think high level management, um, I think that that is when layoffs are gonna happen at that level. So um, upper and upper middle class kind of layoffs. Um, uh, that's what I'm hearing. My friends in finance have, have been saying they think it'll happen in Q3. Uh, when I go onto message boards for attorneys, it looks to me like that would also be a similar time. Um, those are companies that are laying off staff, maybe asking people to take um, uh, wage reductions right now. But honestly, once these big firms and all of them, I think when they come to, when they have a better grip on what the environment looks like, what the corporate environment looks like, um, after things kind of shake out, that will be when they do restructuring. And you'll see people who are making, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, you know, have to see the exit. Right. Um, and obviously, if that were to happen, uh, that would really affect the market because uh, for most of the properties we sell, that uh, is are, are our buyers. Those are our buyers. Not, not everything we sell, but a good proportion of what we sell. Though, those are people that buy our properties. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, if you are a seller, I think if you're a seller at the end of the summer or something like that, um, it would be it would behoove you to be in a situation where you can have backup offers, right? Yes. Uh, even if you go into contract, right? If if you're if your buyer, let's say you have a co-op, or even for their financing, uh, if their deal if that deal was to fall through, it would be a good it would be good if you had people uh, on standby. Um, actually, I want to mention something. You know what Paul said about um, even if you had a co-op, well. What's been a little interesting during this period, which we really haven't touched on, is that um, I think much because people are, you know, they're working remotely and it's not like they're running around. Um, we had a situation where they didn't e even interview um, co-op buyers. They just took their board package and approved them. And uh, Paul and I sold a co-op in downtown Brooklyn. Um, in, in a decent sized building and the packet went in on a Thursday and they interviewed the buyer on a Monday. And really in all my years of doing real estate um, in a building this size, I've never seen anything like that. We were yeah. like pleasantly surprised how quickly this happened. So, um, you know, there are clearly upsides here uh, when people are, you know, have uh, more flexibility and time um, in terms of moving things forward that wouldn't have existed prior to this. Um, and I, my suspicion, and you know, when we get back moving, um, if people are working in offices, 
um, everything's going to be staggered and people are still going to be working home a lot. And um, so I expect that this trend will continue where people have a little more time to, you know, if you're a co-op seller and need your buyer interview, that uh, things might move a little more quickly, even as we open up. I think, you know, I think those things will keep happening. You know, I was, as you were speaking, I was listening, but uh, I'm going to go away from that and go back to something you were talking about before. Sorry, Scott. I was thinking about that 37% of people who said that they weren't sure if they were going to list or not. And I would be really interested to know of those 37% of people, of sellers, um, what, what are their places like? I mean, do they have places that have outdoor space or are they, you know, 900 square foot, two bedroom, one bathroom, apartments with no outdoor space right. right and they're they are more concerned about what the value of their home is because they don't have a big selling point other than you know the uh, the other net aspects of their home well you know it's not something we can talk about in terms of a property but you know again things in brooklyn that matter are what school something is zoned for um, you know, all, I'm saying, um, yeah. you know, in, in Park Slope, there are certain schools that people particularly like to send their kids to. And I got to think even in a sort of, um, you know, market that's out of the or a bit out of the ordinary, that those places also will maintain their value and will be very, you know, will sell very quickly. Yeah, I mean, we've said before, right, that if you had a desirable property to begin with, it's still going to be desirable now. I mean... Uh, the the places that are probably going and ask are reasonably reasonably priced unicorns and and you know also I'm telling buyers right like if you find a place that is your unicorn uh, you know it's not like next like this fall if the market goes down that that unicorn will go for that much less right um, so you know. Um, Something, something to think about. The reason I, I think about this is because um, as I've been running some comps on that two bedroom with the outdoor space that, that, you know, that we're working on, um, I noticed that a lot of the comps are places that have outdoor space. Like the places that are active now just came to the market. This is anecdotal, but they're, they almost all have some sort of outdoor space as a selling point. And just a thought. Yeah, no, no. I look. I, I think you're right. If you're advising buyers, um, interest rates are very low. Um, yeah. You know, I I think uh, you know it's conceivable in the fall you might get a bit of a discount, but I don't think it's gonna. You know, in the places you're describing, I don't think it's gonna be that significant. Um, and you know, we don't know. You know, and interest rates could go up also, and that'll. You're you're basically at the same point you started here. They um, could. I don't know. I think they're going to stay low for a while. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know how how the country is going to, you know, reinflate things. You know, we're so reliant on the interest rate and on stock values. You know, that's. I personally think that rates will stay are going to they're going to have to stay low. Yeah. No, I agree with that. I think they'll be low for the foreseeable future. Um, that's really what's kept us going through this, and I don't see any changes about that as well. Um, I mean, unless the government does something, some sort of like, you know, big, gigantic cash influx into the, into the system, and we need to somehow inflate, or actually we need to fight inflation at that in, in right. that case rates will have to stay low right, right. so yeah i'm not i'm not too worried about that for for anybody yes i don't see anything changing in the foreseeable future um oh uh question some sort of outdoor space please i mean uh you know bill and drew i live in a two bedroom one bath like 900 square foot apartment with two kids uh i would take a 50 square foot Juliet balcony right now. <laughs> Just something where I can open my window and get a little fresh air. So it, 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 it's relative. Um, I think what we're usually thinking of with some outdoor space is a yard. A yard is good. A roof deck. 
um, a balcony, maybe something like, you know, more than 80 square feet where you can put a table and some chairs. I think yeah. that's kind of what I have in mind when I'm thinking some outdoor space. Yeah, I, I think, again, um, given what people have experienced in the last few months, just even having a small amount of outdoor space, what Paul said really. Some place you can put a table and two chairs, it doesn't have to be huge, but just feels like you can get out of your apartment. Uh, for, worse, for worse, because of global warming, uh, you can probably use that space more than you ever could. Um, but, uh, you know, when I, you know, I've certainly growing up in, in uh, Queens and living in Brooklyn most of my adult life have seen massive changes in, in climates and you know since I was a kid um, but I think uh, people really have felt very grateful um, whether they own a house or an apartment with a decent sized terrace that during especially people with children during this period that they've just had a place to go and um, you know, yeah. I, we talked about this Wednesday night. Um, you know, Brooklyn is clearly less dense than Manhattan. Um, not, there, not that there won't be some people leaving, but I actually see people sort of, you know, maybe moving around to get outdoor space within Brooklyn uh, rather than leaving the city. Um, though I think we'll see, you know, a little of everything, as, you know, as the months go. And we discussed on Wednesday, some people are just going to buy a second house in a community not that far from uh, the five boroughs that they can escape to pretty easily. Yeah. Um, you know, as to your question here about a common courtyard, I do think private outdoor space is the, is the most desirable, right? But um, any sort of easily accessible outdoor space, I mean, it, it helps. I mean, my kids are going to go, we have a parking lot in the back of our building. My kids are going to just go ride their scooters around back there. And right. I mean, we're, <laughs> okay. we're, we're happy that we have that, right? So um, I think it, it probably depends how much is that common courtyard being used. I mean, if it's crowded, maybe not. Maybe maybe not as uh, desirable, but really any sort of outdoor space is better than nothing. You know, when when we're discussing this, one place that comes to mind is the the Ansonia co-ops in the South Slope, which have yeah. amazing shared outdoor space. Like to me, that is a even though it's you know, and there are people. Some people do have their own private outdoor space. But that level of shared outdoor space is clearly going to be a big positive. Like kids can run around and you don't have to worry about running, the, you know, running out on the street. Like that place in particular um, now to me becomes that more desirable because of the like large shared common space. Yeah, it could depend on the density of that outdoor space relative to the number of people who live in your building and how it's used, right? So, you know, our parking lot is big enough that we can have three families out there at, you know, dozens of feet apart from each other with their kids each having their own, like, socially distanced, specific, like, uh, uh, sufficient space to do something. If it was, you know... a a two car lot, then we wouldn't be able to have as many people out there at the same time. I'm in a 36 unit building. What if brokers park there illegally? Has that ever been an issue? Oh, I, haven't seen him in a, I haven't seen him in a little while. Oh, so. Okay, that's, that's good. <laughs> um, so I, I do want to say for people that came on, uh, we started a little uh, at the beginning, we talked. So um, this will be a continuing series. Um, on Wednesday night, we're going to have. Um, some uh, a, a team from Westchester County that uh, I'm sorry Wednesday night is Fairfield Connecticut. County Connecticut. Um, and Danielle and Ian will sort of lead that having uh, both grown up in Fairfield County and it's a team that sort of specializes in Westport, Wilton, Norwalk, Weston, that area and they're going to talk about people leaving the city and moving there and what people's options are. Uh, Friday night, we're going to have an additional uh, webinar about moving to Westchester. 
And then a week from today, Sunday morning, uh, where you can bring your coffee, we're going to have Assemblywoman Joanne Simon that represents uh, downtown Brooklyn, Brooklyn Heights, Cobble Hill, Care Gardens, to talk about, uh, you know, what you can do for your community and, um, you know, what the state uh, has been doing uh, to fight the, uh, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Wednesday after that, we'll have my brother talking about oh, correct. drug trials and vaccine trials and how to understand, you know, what is in the news about drugs, vaccines, and um, clinical trials versus hospital tests. Which I think will be very informative. So um, if, you, if you have friends that you think might be interested, um, please share the link with them. Um, you'll start seeing uh, more about our Wednesday Connecticut uh, uh, webinar soon. Um, you know, you can check on Facebook and on Instagram. And those of you who are on um, some of our email lists will be getting information as well. If you want to um, be on an email list, you can email us at uh, the Scott Klein team at compass.com and we'll gladly include you with, you know, uh, in all future events, have, have notice of that. So um, it's a beautiful day and um, I'm, I'm glad for those who joined us. Thank you very much. And of course, if you have other questions, you can email us at that address, you know, anytime and we will get back to you as well. Anything else, Paul? Not me. Just have a good one. Absolutely. Have a great Sunday, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.